Today's build is going to feature me getting back to my roots. That's right, we've got used Xeons, Linux, and a tower that has no business being a gaming PC. Looking to build or upgrade your gaming PC? The new lineup of Ares Memory from Lexar is the easiest decision you'll ever make. Its sleek design will match perfectly with any build. And with Ondai error correction, your overclocks won't leave you bleeding. Ares not only delivers speed, but it rams its way through your computing memory needs without locking horns. Rhett, what is with all these puns? Ares means ram, Jeff. It's Latin. Get your RAM on with Lexar's Ares DDR4 or DDR5 memory kits by following the link down in the video description. Welcome back to Craft Computing, everyone. As always, I'm Jeff. On the desk next to me is my latest build, and this time it's going to be a little bit outside the norm, but at the same time, getting back to the roots of this channel. This is an HP Z440 workstation that I picked up on eBay for just $110 shipped straight to my door. These HP towers have been longtime fan favorites for people looking to stick to a budget, but need a pretty capable gaming or workstation PC. And that's exactly what we're gonna build today. So what exactly did I get for my $110? Well, the HP Z440 chassis might just be a matte black, unassuming case, but it is a fantastically sturdy foundation for putting a PC together. Inside of that, we've got an Intel C612 chipset motherboard from HP, as well as a 700 watt, 90 plus efficient power supply. As far as CPU compatibility goes, you can use any Xeon from the 1600 or 2600 V3 or V4 families. For today, I've got an Intel Xeon 1660 V4 8 core 16 threaded unit with a 3.2 GHz base clock and a 3.8 GHz max turbo. Best of all, the CPU was just $99 on eBay. Memory is also fairly inexpensive, as this uses DDR4 registered ECC DIMMs, and I managed to pick up 32 gigs of that for just 80 bucks. When it comes to storage, your options are going to be just a little bit limited, as the system does only natively support SATA connections. Now, you can add in a PCI Express to NVMe adapter and boot off of that, but to keep costs down, I went ahead and just went with some SATA hard drives. For $85, I managed to pick up a Samsung 870 EVO 1TB SSD that we'll use for our boot drive. And then for our mass storage, we went with a 6TB SATA HGST Helium drive. That one ran me just $70, so we are only into the storage for about $150 in total. As I wanted this build to be a little bit of a workstation and a little bit of a gaming PC, I opted to go with the RTX 3060 12 gig for the graphics card. This is the Asus ROG Strix GPU, and a huge shout out to Micro Center for sending this over for this build. While the 3060 Ti would make more sense for a pure gaming PC, I wanted the 12 gigabytes of GDDR6 for video editing or other high intensive video workloads. Last but not least, I went ahead and tossed in one optional part, but one that I've never been able to check out before. And that is this very interesting CPU cooler that's sitting on the desk in front of me. This is a stock all-in-one liquid cooler that was actually made for the HP Z840 workstation, but will mount right up to the Z440. Now, this did come with a 120 millimeter tower cooler, but come on, it's a tiny little self-contained liquid cooler. I had to try it out. And with all the introductions out of the way, let's go ahead and get this thing together.
All right, welcome back. As you can see, the build is now up and running, and I've had a day or two to play with it. So let's get into some pros and cons, as well as one detail that went horribly wrong. And that being that I had to punt on the custom HP water cooler. Now, I knew when I purchased this, it uses a five pin connector that is custom to HP, as HP so often does on their own coolers. The Z440 motherboard uses an even different cable that uses a six pin header. And this is different from the standard four pin PWMs that you find on consumer boards. These cables aren't really anything weird or exotic and are often just a PWM connector with an extra ground cable on board. Now, there does exist a couple different third-party options to convert this 5-pin connector into a 6-pin connector that should be able to plug into the Z440 and allow the system to see the fan. The adapter just moves pin 5 onto pin 3, essentially duplicating the voltage signal that's coming out. Now, while I was able to get both the fan and the pump spinning, the Z440 refused to recognize that there was a fan connected to the system and ran this thing at 100%. That would have been fine if it was just for the pump, but not for the CPU fan, as it's actually quite loud. So I swapped back to the 92mm air cooler that the HP Z440 came with. If I'm able to get the pump running in the future, I might post a quick short about it or something, or you'll probably see it over on my Discord. Join the Patreon to get part of that. Moving on from the cooler, the goals for this PC were pretty simple. I wanted to put together a solid PC capable of running both workstation tasks as well as doing some light gaming. But the kicker was I wanted to run Linux. Now, while I've had some decent success with the community version of SteamOS from the Holo ISO project, I couldn't use that version here. First, only AMD and Intel GPUs are supported in the early alpha. Secondly, while Steam's new mobile launcher is great, I wanted a full desktop experience out of the gate with no rebooting between Steam and the desktop. Installing Pop! OS, to me, looked like a near-perfect solution. One of the installers for Pop! OS that you can download comes preloaded with NVIDIA drivers, supporting the RTX 3060 right out of the box. Now, while SteamOS is getting quite the name for itself for running Windows applications inside of Linux, the packages required to do that are actually incredibly easy to install. Getting Pop! OS 22.04 up and running was faster and easier than Windows 11, needing only around six minutes from clicking on install to landing on the desktop. Plus, there was no Cortana, Microsoft account creation, or any trackers to disable. Nice. To get all of my games up and running, I'm going to install two applications from the Pop Shop, Steam and Lutris. Lutris is a game application manager for Linux that not only serves as a one-stop installer and launcher, it actually allows you to handle compatibility for running non-native Linux games and applications. Now, I actually don't have an Origin or an Epic Games account, so I can't speak to either of those launchers. But as far as Steam and GOG, the process of installing and launching games was incredibly simple. For Steam games, you just need to enable Steam Play for all titles. This allows Steam's compatibility packages from Proton to work their magic on just about every game in your library. You'll need to grab the latest package by selecting Tools from your game browser and then navigating to Proton 7.0. The minor releases are kept up to date automatically once this is installed. As far as games from other platforms, you just need to install the Proton packages for Wine inside of Lutris. Simply go to Preferences, Runners, and then click on the Download button next to Wine. Scroll all the way down to the bottom and select the latest version of Proton, which at the time of filming is 7.16. Once that's installed, close out of the window and click on the Settings cog for Wine. Just select Proton as the default Wine version from the drop-down menu. This should allow you to use Proton from any of your game libraries, meaning just about every Windows game that you own, regardless of the platform, should now work. Now, I'm not going to go into full detail about games compatibility or performance here, as I've already done that in my SteamOS 3.0 video. Check that out here if you haven't seen that one yet. One quick note though, even though I have an RTX-enabled GPU, ray tracing and DLSS are not well supported through Wine or Proton. Native Linux games will have full ray tracing support, though. As far as gaming performance goes, I will say I was quite impressed overall. Doom Eternal ran at 4K and the Nightmare preset at around 90 frames per second. Cyberpunk 2077 managed 60 FPS at 1080p and ultra settings. Borderlands 3 sat at around 100 frames per second at 1080p and high settings. Fallout 4, Elden Ring, BeamNG Drive, all playing just as well as I would expect from a Xeon 1660 V4 and an RTX 3060. 
Loading times were not great from the 6TB HGST hard drive, but I knew that would be a trade-off going in. I wanted something with a little bit more storage space in this build rather than pure SSD speed. And overall, I'm still quite pleased with the results, especially for the money that I paid. When it comes to using a Linux PC for a workstation, there seems to be only one opinion from the Linux community. Use a free and open source alternative to your Windows application. Do you edit video using Adobe Premiere? You'd better switch to DaVinci Resolve or OpenShot. How about photo editing? Well, have you heard of our Lord and Savior, GIMP? Now this will come as no surprise to anyone who's followed my channel for some time, but personally, I've always found this line of thinking to be fairly insulting to professionals who are actually interested in running Linux instead of Windows. While Resolve may be a great editor that has feature parity with Premiere, the workflow is far from the same. And when it comes to every other Linux alternative, feature parity really doesn't exist. Audacity is a fine audio editor, but it's no replacement for Adobe Audition or some of the likes from PreSonus. Same with GIMP versus Photoshop, Libre or Google Docs versus Microsoft Office and Excel, Inkscape instead of Illustrator. There are some features in software that are not easily recreated, nor are workflows all that well translated. So as much as I love open source and Linux in general, I also understand that as a workstation OS, it's not going to work for everyone. Now, this PC definitely has the hardware chops to be a competent professional PC, but I fear that software may end up being its downfall for that use. Proton and Wine have become some seriously powerful tools over the last handful of years to enable support for Windows applications inside of Linux. But try as I might, I haven't had much luck with mainstream professional applications. So if GIMP, Audacity, OpenShot, FreeCAD, or any of the other open source options work for you, that's fantastic. Pop OS and a PC like this could very well be a viable option for you. For those whose workflow depends on a particular set of applications though, keep rooting for gaming to succeed in Linux, because the apps you want to use may depend on how popular Linux becomes over the next handful of years, spearheaded by gamers. Before we go, I want to once again give a shout out to Micro Center for sending over the ASUS ROG Strix RTX 3060 for this build. Micro Center is the place where you can get all of your PC hardware under one roof, or if you don't live by one, order online at microcenter.com. For a limited time, new customers can receive $25 off their choice of Intel or AMD CPUs. Valid in store only, make sure to check the link down below for more details. And once again, a huge shout out to Micro Center for making this video possible. Links for the rest of this build will also be down in the video description. Make sure to give those a click if you're looking at building an HP Z440 of your own. On your way down there, make sure to drop this video a like and subscribe to Craft Computing if you haven't done so already. Follow me on Twitter at Craft Computing for daily shenanigans like this. And if you like the content you see on this channel and want to help support me in what I do, consider joining the Patreon. Link is down in the video description. As a bonus, you'll get exclusive access to my Discord server, where you can chat with myself and the other hosts from Talking Heads. That's going to do it for me in this one. Thank you all so much for watching, and as always, I will see you in the next video. Cheers, guys. That is seriously a dangerous beer. Beer for today is from Monkless Belgian Ales out of Bend, Oregon. This is the Four Devils Belgian Style Golden Ale. Particular beer clocks in at 9%. Had Bunkless beers a number of times. I will say the last one that I had, I was not a fan of. As it said, it was a hazy IPA, and what it tasted like was a not Belgian farmhouse. So hopefully this one's an improvement. The devil is in the details with this devilishly smooth and light-bodied 9% beauty. Four Devils is our classic Belgian golden ale that is dry and slightly fruity with a subtle earthy hop presence. The bouquet is sweet with a mild spiciness intertwined with a pleasant pineapple character. Oh man, that one is tasty. If you like Belgians, this is kind of... Gosh, how do I even explain this one? Boy, very malty, very Belgian-like right up front. That, that rich, sweet, yeasty smell that really only Belgian beers can have. Uh, that's what's right on the nose of this. Shocking that it's a Belgian-style golden ale, huh?
Oh, man. That is tasty. And for a summer beer, quite dangerous. Uh, remember, this is 9%. And man, this drinks like something half of its ABV. This drinks like a 4.5% wheat ale. Uh, that is super light. It's fruity. There's this, like I said, that nice, rich Belgian malt kind of carries it all the way through. I'm not getting any notes of a poppiness, and I'm definitely not tasting any pineapple, uh, although there are some fruit essence flavors in here, uh, but I'm not pulling pineapple out specifically. But overall, that's a dang good beer.